While solving energy poverty is within our reach, today nearly a billion people lack access to electricity and hundreds of millions more have unreliable access. If current trends continue, more than half a billion people will still lack access to electricity in 2030, the majority in sub-Saharan Africa. At the Rockefeller Foundation, we are using data and technology to bring affordable, reliable, and clean power to all, faster and cheaper than ever before. Distributed renewable energy solutions, including mini grids, are already empowering rural communities worldwide. The World Bank estimates that as many as 490 million people would be best served by off-grid electrification, requiring 210,000 mini grids to reach the UN's Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Working together with our global partners, we can dramatically speed up electrification by unleashing the full potential of decentralized renewable energy, improving the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people, and creating an avenue for rapid economic and social development. We will continue to build partnerships across sectors, investing in scalable solutions that empower communities around the world. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for the Washington Post. And this morning we're gonna be talking about how to reset our future in terms of our supplies of energy and our economic development. I'm pleased today uh, that we're able to have this discussion uh, at a moment when we have good news on the health front with the announcement this morning by Pfizer uh, of its third stage vaccine trials and also a moment when many, many uh, millions of people in America and around the world have a sense of new opportunity and political change. What we want to talk about today in an all-star one-hour panel are the specifics of key areas of climate, energy, and economic development. I want to start off uh, our first panel with Raj Shah, who is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation uh, and uh, welcome Lord Nicholas Stern, uh, who is a distinguished economist at the London School of Economics and chair of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. Raj and Nick, thank you so much for joining us at Washington Post Live today. Thank you for having us. Pleasure to be with you. So uh, Raj, let me uh, b begin with you and ask you to set the foundations for our conversation by talking uh, about what access to energy is all about. And maybe you could be specific in defining what, what you see as energy poverty in the world today. Well, th thank you, David, for the question and for your leadership in, in pulling this together. Uh, you know, the reality is for those of us that have worked on addressing poverty and inclusive growth, over the last many decades, it is abundantly clear that people who do not have access to reliable, always on electricity simply cannot be part of a modern economy and struggle to improve their labor productivity and grow their local economies, grow their businesses, create jobs, and improve the livelihoods of their families and lifestyle of their kids. And so when we look around the world, there are perhaps 800 million people that live in what is defined as energy poverty. And that's a very extreme definition. That means people don't have, technically it means people don't have 150 kilowatt hours uh, per capita per year of energy. What that means in practice is they really don't have lighting in their homes, in their communities, 
and, and really have no real electricity access. A much larger number, perhaps up to 2 billion people, are fundamentally constrained in their ability to grow because the electricity access they have is erratic and unreliable. And I was uh, in November before we had to lock down from the COVID crisis in a part of India, a state called Bihar. And you'd walk through the village and, you know, right around four or five o'clock, uh, the lights went out and things got dark quickly. And, you know, people who had little restaurant carts and small roadside businesses just started packing up and going home because, you know, you can't run a business with no lighting and no electricity. And a, f a few minutes later, a Rockefeller Foundation supported Minigrid, which is a solar installation in that village, uh, which I talk about later, uh, helped turn the lights back on and all of a sudden economic life restarted. And you could see it with your own eyes. And so all we're proposing is that as the world recovers and seeks to invest in a global green recovery, that we use this opportunity to invest in green energy for people who otherwise live in energy poverty. And in the process of recovering from COVID-19 and the economic fallout, we lift a billion or two billion people into, a, into the modern global economy. Raj, just give us a little more detailed snapshot of what it would mean for one of those villages in India or Africa or anywhere around the world to have access to uh, energy, to electricity, what kinds of economic development would be possible in those places that today are so underserved? Well, let me just tell you about some of the families I met. You know, I met a mother who described how uh, being a customer, and by the way, these are commercial enterprises that are providing green electricity uh, to these families, but, but she described how being able to turn the lights on in her home at night allowed her daughter to read and in the evening and study and improved her ability to participate in school and, and be hopeful about her future. I met another gentleman who had a small farm, as many of these families do, uh, who was able to buy a, a rice hulling machine uh, so that he could process the output off his farm and, and was actually doing that for all the other nearby farms, earning some extra income that he was then investing in his kids going to school. I met a woman who taught uh, young girls how to use sewing machines and, uh, and in, in an effort to make cloth and uh, repair clothing items and earn income. And she was able to teach them in the evenings because she had light on and they were able to transition from mechanical to electrical sewing machines. I mean, all, all of these uh, small examples add up to jobs, they add up to education for girls in particular, and they add up to the kind of inclusive growth that can lift a billion or two billion people out of uh, poverty and into the modern economy where they can be hopeful about their future. And we know that COVID-19 is perhaps pushing almost half a billion people back under an expanded definition of the poverty line. That's what the World Bank is estimating. We know how to solve that problem, but we got to act now and we have to make sure all of those families can benefit from what you and I and Nick benefit from every day. You wake up and you use energy from the moment you're awake to the moment you go to bed and then even while you're sleeping, you know, to do everything from uh, air conditioning to lighting to allowing our computers and digital technologies to work to powering modern society. And we can achieve that outcome for everybody if we act now. Nick, uh, we're talking about resetting the future, uh, about the kinds of, of, of new technologies and opportunities that Raj just described. A at a moment when so much of the world feels flat on its back because of the, the COVID pandemic, you've talked about the need for stimulus, economic stimulus packages around the world that power this future financially. Maybe you could give us some opening thoughts ab about the economics of this. How do, we, how do we get the money for stimulating development and change into the hands of governments and people? Thank you very much, David, for drawing us together. Um, I think the first thing to recognize um, before we talk about the response is just how big this crisis is. I mean, what we've seen in the rich world is the ability really to pump resources into the economy. 
to reduce somewhat the effects of uh, the crisis on employment and livelihoods. The very big stimuli, perhaps of the order of you know, 12, 12 trillion dollars, that's come from the rich countries. That's in a world economy of 80 something trillion dollars. It's huge. But the poor countries have not been able to do that because they can't borrow in their own currency, in their own currencies. Sub-Saharan Africa has not been able to uh, borrow. Uh, no country in Sub-Saharan Africa has been able to borrow since February. So rich countries do what it takes and poor countries do what they can. And what they can is not really very much. They've been hit by falling remittances. That's the money sent back from people who are working overseas. The biggest fall since record began. They've been hit by drop in tourism for many. They've been hit by capital flight, hit by very uh, volatile commodity prices. And that's what's led to the big increase in poverty, which Raj just described. So those resources are critically needed. And what we have to do as a world is to enable the investment that's going to get us out of this uh, deep depression associated with COVID and set us on the way to um, a much more attractive, sustainable story of growth, which is much more friendly to the climate, reduces emissions, increases resilience and so on. So we have to be able to uh, help with resources, to help the investments that are vitally necessary, particularly in the poorest countries in the world. The best way to do that, in my view, is to increase the special drawing rights um, available to the, which the IMF can make available. They could do that in two tranches of 500 billion each. This was suggested um, by Larry Summers and Guillermo Ortiz at a recent G30 meeting. That can be done. And that would make an enormous difference to the ability of the developing countries to rekindle investment, to boost investment by the two or three percentage points of GDP that's crucially necessary, and take us through into what would be a new Marshall Plan for people and a planet. But it does need those resources, and that's going to need a decision in the IMF, and the US is absolutely crucial to that, and I hope that it's uh, very high up on President Lex Biden's uh, agenda. Uh, it would enable the rest of the world to do to embark on something like the very sensible plan he has for sustainable infrastructure and equitable clean energy in uh, in the United States. Nick, I, I want to come back in, in a minute or, or two to the details of of how uh, this might be financed. What we mean when we say a new uh, Marshall uh, uh, plan, but I, I want to ask you first. Just to say briefly, what would be the consequences of not addressing this problem? Uh, are we looking at a situation where much of the world really is sliding backwards in terms of their economic uh, security, uh, level of poverty, uh, into a, a world that's grimmer than, than most of the world may, much of the rest of the world may imagine? Yeah, Raj was just describing, you know, how many hundreds of millions of people could slide back into poverty. Uh, we're seeing children out of school and that damage to their education is very long lasting. Many of them will never get back into school. We've seen, of course, health systems under enormous pressure and unemployment itself is devastating for the social and political uh, fabric of nations. Just look at what happened in Europe to uh, those countries uh, after a prolonged period of unemployment. It is, it is deeply, deeply dangerous. So whether you look at education or health or incomes and income poverty and food poverty, uh, if you look at the political and social dangers, this is a world that's in deep crisis. And we can see the way through. We can drive the economies of the rich countries forward and we can make the resources available uh, to the poorer countries to invest in their own economies. And once that gets going, the big part is driven by private sector investment. 
So I want to ask uh, Raj to help us think about the specific technologies that could be used to provide greater access to energy in some of those villages, Raj, that you helped us to, to think about. You've talked about mini grids, uh, about, about decentralized ways of providing uh, power for people. Sketch that out for us a little bit more so we, we see what new technologies, what new ways of doing this might be uh, over the next hill. Sure. Well, let me, let me actually build on what Nick just said, because I think these two things go hand in hand. The, the industrial world, or, or really the world, has already mounted a, a recovery response to the economic crisis that COVID-19 has caused and, and spent about $12.5 trillion on such recovery efforts broadly, if you include monetary policy actions you know, in their, in their nominal terms. And when you compare that to what developing nations are able to do, as Nick points out, it's much, much, much less significant. And we haven't seen anything like that kind of an investment in those national economies at this point in time. So the trillion dollars that Nick is talking about making available to the world's lesser developed nations via the IMF and other partners would be an extraordinary and absolutely critical investment to create a jobs-rich green recovery in those settings. Then, David, to your question of, well, what would that green recovery actually look like? Why would it be different than what we've done for decades, which is build out infrastructure the more traditional way, roads, bridges, and big power plants, often coal plants, uh, connected to communities around a nation by big, uh, you know, long uh, connections and grids. The reality is the technology in the last five years has totally changed what's possible to create green electrification for billions of people who, are, as I mentioned before, are economically held back because of a lack of access to reliable and affordable electricity. Today, solar panels, extraordinarily cheap, very highly productive. We see in projects the Rockefeller Foundation has supported in India and around the world that you can, in fact, provide uh, off-grid solar electricity to families for less than 20 cents a kilowatt hour. We project that going to 15 cents a kilowatt hour in just the next uh, few months and certainly in 2021. It, what that means is all of a sudden the, the most efficient way to provide power to people who don't have it so they can lift themselves and their communities up is not big coal plants connected to long power lines. It is actually new technology, but photovoltaics, new energy storage technologies, in particular lithium ion batteries, which we are today testing and rolling out in these mini grid systems that dramatically reduce the cost and increase the effectiveness of those systems as a source of productive power for small businesses and industrial application. Actually, artificial intelligence, you, you can now run these mini grid systems remotely using AI, which dramatically changes the cost structure and the personnel required on site. We use smart meters. These are meters that allow families to know exactly how much power they're consuming, pay for that power, usually on mobile phones, and, and via mobile text payment systems. The technology that is now available to create green infrastructure that will lift up a billion or two billion people around the world is extraordinary and is very different than what was available five to seven years ago. So, uh, you know, so we really the world should not rely on the, you know, hundreds of gigawatts of coal that is currently being planned and built out to address the electricity needs of emerging economies. We should make a shift to new technology, to green technologies, and we should use this moment in time, this crisis of COVID-19 and the potential for a trillion dollar policy response to actually do this the right way to protect our future from both a, a inclusive growth perspective and a climate perspective. Nick, I'd like to ask you if you'd, uh, in effect, uh, write a verbal memo to President-elect Biden, uh, Vice President-elect uh, Harris, but also to leaders around the world. We're, we're at a moment where you're describing the need, in, in a sense, as never before to work together 
but we're in a, in a period that's been characterized by a retreat from globalization. We've seen that in the United States, obviously, but we've seen it in many countries around the world. And I'd ask you how you see the world pulling together. Is it a question simply of working through the institutions like the IMF and the World Bank uh, that were created after World War II? Are there new institutions that are needed? What's, what's the, the policy letter you'd write if you had a chance to put it in Vice President, uh, President-elect Biden's hands? Who knows, maybe we will write such a letter with Raj. Um, the, the first thing is the shared understanding that a sustainable recovery is a strong recovery. If you want to recover strongly and well, go the sustainable route. So many of the things are fast, labor intensive, strong economic multipliers, whether it's restoring degraded land, natural capital, or getting out the electricity <clears throat> that uh, Raj was describing there. And that sustainable development is strong development. It really is lower cost, much better across so much of the story. So that shared understanding that we need a sustainable recovery, and that will give you a strong recovery and the sustainable development and that it's desperately urgent because of the deep, deep difficulties of COVID and we're running out of time on climate. So that shared understanding is fundamental. You collaborate if you've got shared objectives and clarity over what you need to do. The second is to recognize that these phenomena are deeply global. Unless we act together, we will not tackle these problems, either of COVID and the recovery from the crisis, that's a global medical crisis, or climate will not solve those unless we act together. So understand the magnitude of what we need to do and understand that we have to act together. And then support those international institutions which are capable of moving on this. The uh, multilateral development banks and development finance institutions, IMF playing a very strong role, of course, through the special drawing rights recognize the importance of the United Nations as a forum where we can get together. So in other words, use the institutions that were created after the Second World War for recovery and make them, uh, put them to work in a much stronger way. And they'll need more resources to do that. They'll need to collaborate better to do that. A grand bargain that these institutions will get more resources, but we expect more of them in terms of how they work together, in particular, how they support the uh, private sector. Use the G7, G20 frameworks, as it happens the UK in the presidency of the G7. I believe that it will be pressing strongly for sustainable recovery and getting together around that. So those are the ways forward around understanding of the problem, around understanding of how we can uh, do much better and how we can work together through the institutions that we have. So I don't think we need more institutions, but we do need to make much stronger, more effective use of them. There are good people there. We get behind them, then I think they can deliver. And of course, country by country, you have to act and have to act strongly. China, the biggest countries have the biggest roles. And China is very important here, holds something like a quarter of sub-Saharan African uh, debt. Uh, the biggest uh, emitter of greenhouse gases. But China has declared for net zero emissions, carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, President Biden will declare for um, net zero by 2050. They have a common purpose. They've stated that common purpose. So it's around that that I think we can get together. And then we'll do better on the things that we might be, uh, find more difficult, like trade and so on. But the common purpose around climate and development is surely something that people can work together on. Nick, what I hear you saying is that this sustainable recovery simply won't be possible unless countries work together. Uh, it, it can't happen any other way. Rush, I want to ask you the practical question that in our global capitalist economy, uh, people obviously think about, which is how do we make money uh, through this process. Maybe you could talk a little bit about 
the partnership that the Rockefeller Foundation has with Tata Power in, in India and why that company and others, uh, I'm sure, think there's money to be made down the road that we're describing. Well, you know, the vision that, that Nick is laying out uh, of, of massive public uh, stimulus in this moment to put an economic floor under much of the developing world uh, and their economies in order to support a vision of inclusive growth and climate sustainability for the future depends fundamentally on unlocking private investment against that vision. And so the trillion dollars that Nick makes reference to would make it possible for nations to provide subsidies, to create policy frameworks, to put stimulus resources in place. But ultimately, the whole vision is only achieved if you get real public-private partnership and you get real private investment as the driver of a future greener, more inclusive economy. We're seeing that happen in places where we work around the world. In India, we launched a billion dollar joint venture with Tata Power to build 10,000 of these rural mini grid systems. As I mentioned, they can provide power to customers you know, at an affordable price. Uh, we know that customers pay at a rate of 97 plus percent. And as a result, it's a private commercial project uh, in which the Rockefeller Foundation and Tata Power partner together. Now we need government. We need government to provide a, a modest subsidy for the installation of these grids. We need government to create some rules so that you know the, the usual state utilities create the room for private companies to come in and be transform transformative and bring the new technology. But ultimately, it's a it's a private commercial enterprise, and we've seen the same uh, take hold in Africa, in Latin America, and Puerto Rico. Uh, there are lots of opportunities to to marry the vision of a big green stimulus with uh, the practical reality of private investment that that is many times the level of investment we're talking about here. And just to put it in perspective, you know these projects. I'd say in general, while I can't speak to the Tata project specifically, but in general, uh, they earn reasonable returns, you know, and, and in a world with uh, very low interest rates right now for the foreseeable future and on a global basis, a 12, 14, 16% local currency return uh, is often uh, quite attractive from the perspective of long-term infrastructure investment. So uh, there's every reason to believe that if, the IMF can accelerate its uh, actions now in this moment that sovereign wealth funds, other large pools of pension capital and private capital and public capital could come together and, and we could have a sweet spot that creates a real public-private approach to greening the global economy. Let me close with a very down-to-earth uh, question on the minds of all of our viewers here and people around the world. How does the election of Joe Biden as the next president of the United States change the opportunities for achieving the kind of sustainable development that you've described? Uh, Nick, start us off by, by talking about what you think it's going to mean for the, for the rest of the world. And then Raj, I'd ask you to close by talking about what it means in America. Um. The United States has been blocking the expansion of the special drawing rights at the IMF. So if it uh, came behind it, that would be a fantastic uh, increase in resources for the poorest countries of the world. It enables the United States and China to agree on something important. That's the fight against climate change. And they will have both declared for net zero emissions by mid-century, the US in 2050, China by 2060. So there will be uh, resources released, as I just described, to the uh, special drawing rights, and there'll be a place to collaborate, a subject to collaborate, the most important subject on which to collaborate, building sustainable development. And it will have that same opportunity with Europe as well, that's declared for net zero by 2050. So the opportunities to collaborate will be transformed by this election and it will bring hope, and that hope will bring investment, particularly the private investment, which Raj and I have been emphasizing so strongly. That will drive the story. 
but it needs a big strategy. And now we can put that big strategy in place around the world. This is a transformation. Rush, David, I, I, would, I would add to that. I, I think, you know, I ran US, the US Agency for International Development under the Obama administration. And nine years ago, last Tuesday, to the day, uh, then Vice President Joe Biden came over to USAID and spoke to our staff to say thank you. And he was thanking the team there for uh, really decades of work at addressing poverty, at charging into humanitarian crises, and at recognizing that the great untold challenge of our time is extending the reach of human dignity to everybody, whether they are a young child that has been abused in uh, wartime type activities in parts of Africa or a girl in Afghanistan who gets to go to school and gets to be part of an economy that's electrified and able to create jobs and opportunity for her family and her community. And I, I think uh, Joe Biden was chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, an extraordinary vice president and on, active on international affairs and understands deeply the role of American leadership in this moment. And I share Nick's enthusiasm uh, that, you know, embracing a green recovery that actually is not uh, exclusively about climate, but recognizes the deep interconnected nature of our climate future and and making sure that every single person is a part of that future. That's something Joe Biden gets and can help lead uh, both in the United States and around the world. And I think the theme that you've heard from him over and over when he says, when I think climate, I hear jobs uh, is as true in America as it is in other parts of the world. And I'm very, very hopeful that this is a major turning point in our ability to lift up climate and development together through concerted U.S. leadership. And President Biden, when he's inaugurated, will be uh, the president that can make that happen. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. You've given us a lot to think about. You've helped us to see this idea of resetting our, our global economy on a more sustainable path in in very uh, clear, specific detail. So thank you for joining us. After a short video, we'll be right back with the second half of our program. We'll begin with Mary Robinson, a former president of Ireland, and we hope to be joined uh, soon after that by Secretary of former Secretary of State John Kerry. So uh, stay with us. We'll be back uh, in a moment after the video. That is how a lot of people feel today. So far to go, so little time. And that is the story of where we find ourselves on a global basis uh, with respect to one of the toughest challenges we've ever faced. Welcome back. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Washington Post. Uh, thanks for joining us for our discussion today about how to reset the, the future in terms of energy and sustainable development. Uh, we're joined in the second half of, of our discussion by Mary Robinson, former uh, president of Ireland, former High Commissioner for Human Rights at the United Nations, and John Kerry, former Secretary of State of the United States and the founder of World War Zero. Uh, organization committed to dealing with climate change. Let me uh, first ask the two of you the same question that I asked uh, our panelists in the previous uh, segment, uh, uh, Raj, Raj Shah and, and uh, Lord uh, Stern, and that is we've had momentous news uh, over the weekend of the uh, election of Joe Biden as president and Kamala Harris as vice president. I want to ask you each just briefly to say what you think this outcome means for the issues you care most about. And I'd ask uh, Mary Robinson to begin by talking about what it means for the world. Thank you. And that was a great panel earlier. I was listening to Raj and uh, Nick uh, speaking with you. And I want to 
build on a lot of what they were saying. Um, the elders that I now chair actually issued a statement um, this morning uh, welcoming the Biden uh, victory, the Biden-Harris team. And we looked at the, the multilateral aspects of that, and we called for uh, the United States to address uh, getting on track, as we know is in the Biden planning for the 1.5 degree world, rejoin the World Health Organization and other organizations, and give the kind of leadership which the world needs. Because uh, during the four years of the Trump administration, we've seen a deterioration. When the United States is not leading, other countries behave quite badly. And that was part of the problem. So we do need that leadership and we need it urgently because time is very short. And Secretary Kerry, let me ask you to, to say just a word or two about what this uh, election means for the United States of America. We've been a divided country. You've struggled with that uh, as much as any politician I know. Talk a little bit about what you feel after the declaration uh, of, of a new president-elect and vice president-elect. So I apologize, we're, st we're working out uh, audio details uh, with Secretary Kerry. He'll be with us in just a minute. I'm gonna go back to- David, to can you hear me now? David, can you hear me? Ah, uh, Secretary Kerry, you're with us. So I, I hope you heard I my question. You, if you work out climate change as easily as I worked that out, we're all on a great track. I, <laughs> I just pushed the unmute button. It was that, that difficult. <laughs> Good. Well, so give us a snapshot of what you think this means. Well, it's, you know, it's 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 almost an injustice to reduce it to a snapshot, but I will because I think, like so many people around the world, I mean, when the church bells ring in Paris and uh, people are singing from the rooftops of Canada uh, and Britain and around the world, uh, there are block parties. It tells you something. There, there's a breath of fresh air. And there was over the weekend, and people I've talked to just feel it. I mean, the fact, I don't mean, I, I'm not mean spirited in saying this, but just the fact that we haven't heard that much from, uh, from uh, President Trump over the course of these last 24 hours, you sort of feel a difference. Now, that doesn't mean the next month is going to be easy. He's obviously not yet uh, chosen uh, to concede. Uh, and we all understand our efforts being made by some to, to help him understand what has happened. But the bottom line is this, President-elect Biden is moving forward with the transition. Uh, he has been more forward-leaning than any presidential candidate in our history to lay out a very aggressive plan to deal with the uh, uh, climate crisis. And the fact is that uh, uh, it is existential. And not just to us, but to the planet. And if ever there was an issue that should help unite countries in common endeavor, this is it. Uh, and I am. I think that uh, uh, the, the president's plans with respect to every sector of our economy, uh, for transportation, for power, you know, power sector, uh, utilities, uh, the agriculture industry. Uh, buildings, commercial and residential. Uh, there's just a huge ability here to put people to work, to build back better from the effects of COVID-19, to lead the world again in helping to convene and unite people. And it will take, David, every bit of effort, uh, almost at a level similar to what it took to win World War II. People at every level are going to have to contribute to this effort. Why? Because having negotiated Paris for us, for the United States, I can tell you that when we left Paris, we knew we weren't holding the Earth's temperature to two degrees centigrade. And if we did everything that Paris laid out, we would still see a temperature increase to 3.7 degrees on the planet. But we're not doing everything. We're actually heading to 4.1, 4.5 degrees. So this is going to take all the ingenuity, all the creativity, all the convening initiative of universities, colleges, laboratories, 
private sector particularly will play an enormous role in this. But if we apply ourselves, as I believe President-elect Biden intends to and wants to, uh, I think we can get there. And what's most exciting about it is, in the getting there, there is a vision of stronger economies, millions of more better jobs, uh, extraordinary uh, advances in health and well-being of citizens around the world, greater stability to countries that are currently suffering instability because they are climate refugees or because they face challenges in just providing for food or electricity, as, as is the subject uh, of what the Rockefeller Foundation has been working on. So I'm, I'm excited. And I, I, I think people need to be excited about the constructive way in which dealing with the climate crisis can actually help organize the world in a more effective way with much greater positive impact for citizens around the world. Uh, President Robinson, I want to ask you to focus on the urgency of this challenge. We're in a, a moment in the United States, uh, in many quarters and, and around the world of, of uh, celebration, uh, relief, uh, that there's a new opportunity ahead. But make us think about how serious the crisis is. There, there are signs, as Secretary Kerry said, that, that the, the climate crisis is accelerating, that we're nearing a tipping point. Uh, where the ability to reverse uh, disastrous effects uh, may be limited. Talk about that tipping point problem. It is a very real problem. And of course, it affects those who are least responsible for the problem. I talk a lot about climate justice. I can give you five layers briefly of the injustices of climate change, that it affects disproportionately the poorest countries and poorest communities, the small island states, the indigenous communities, and they are the black and brown and indigenous peoples in our world. So it's also a racial injustice, and they are not at all responsible. They don't drive cars and have major manufacturing, etc. Secondly, the gender dimension within that, the different social roles, the lack of land rights or access to credit for a lot of women in developing countries, but they still have to put food on the table, go further in drought for water, the intergenerational injustice that children have come out in their millions to remind our generations of. The injustice of the different pathways to development, and this is one that I'd like John Kerry also to reflect on. The industrialized world, we built our economy on fossil fuel. We have to wean ourselves off with just transition, remembering the workers and their communities and bringing them with us with new opportunities. Um, but what about developing countries? Um, they before Paris committed, promised in their nationally determined contributions to go as green as possible, so many of them. I was the special envoy of the UN Secretary General at the time, and I witnessed this. But they needed the investment, they needed the training, they needed the skills, they needed the technology. And we haven't shown the solidarity, but what has happened is they found more coal, more oil, more gas. So what do they do? Do they exploit this? It will hurt them first and worst because of that injustice of their vulnerability, but it will close the carbon budget for the rest of us. So that's one to really think about if we don't support a sharing the technology with developing countries. And the last injustice, of course, is the injustice to nature herself. Now, I want to come to one other thing that's very much in the minds of those of us who observed this uh, victory of the Biden-Harris team in the United States. Um, the di division, especially in the Senate. And I want to ask John in particular, um, I, I've been following the building of a bipartisan approach to carbon dividends. And I understand there may even be draft legislation on carbon dividends. Is that a way of moving that agenda legislatively forward quite quickly, despite the divide? Or is the divide so bad that the bipartisanship isn't going to be able to, to conquer? Secretary Kerry, that, those are good questions from President Robinson. Uh, we are a divided country. We have big ideas, uh, certainly President Elect Biden does for the future, but how are we gonna get the practical politics done? What would you say in response to uh, Mary Robinson's questions? Well, uh, Mary and I have talked about this a number of times and I agree with her and with the many other people that pricing carbon has for a long time been a critical component of uh, reaching a solution. Uh, it's market-based, 
uh, companies actually do not object to it. And when I was negotiating this in the Senate, uh, in nine, when Barack Obama first became president, we actually had the big oil companies at the table, BP, Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, uh, et cetera, where we're ready to sign on to, to this. They want certainty in the marketplace too. So I think it is very much uh, one of the options that we have available to us. But let me just say that, you know, um, the energy market is, energy policy is the solution to climate crisis. And we have much of the solution staring us in the face. Do we need some new technologies? Absolutely. And, and, and you know, we're going to have a new generation, I believe, with what President-elect Biden wants to do, which is a major uh, coalition of university laboratory effort to innovate and to begin to move to even look at the, uh, for instance, at the possibilities of negative emissions technology, where you're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it to other use. There are things that we can do. There are exciting things happening. But when we left Paris, what we were really doing was having 195 countries simultaneously send a message to the marketplace globally, we're all gonna do our best to deal with alternative, renewable, sustainable energy. And for the first two years, David, $358 billion was invested in alternative renewable energy for the first time ever, more than in fossil fuels. And the world is going to go from four and a half billion to five billion users today, up to nine billion users in the next 30 years. And it is, if we're going to literally survive this, uh, the increase of demand for energy as we do that, it is imperative that it be renewable and sustainable uh, or hydrogen or, I mean, whatever the, there are a lot of possibilities out there. But energy demand right now is up more than 60% the last 15 years in Southeast Asia alone. And it's growing at twice the pace of China. So Southeast Ener Asia energy demand is slated to grow by almost two thirds by 2040. And unfortunately, uh, the world is moving in the right direction in some ways, but uh, Asia is home to the one country on the planet that actually reduced its solar power deployment over the last 10 years. That's Malaysia. So it all comes down to one word, coal. Coal in the last five years, for example, Vietnam's coal use rose by 75%. That's a record globally. China is about to bring 21 gigatons of coal-fired power online. If that happens, it is Katie bar the door. It's all, you cannot get to 1.5, you will not get to two degrees. And already we're seeing the extraordinary damage to this planet at 1.2 degrees. So um, we're gonna have to you know, undertake extraordinary initiatives here. But again, I would repeat, I mean, Mary, this is gonna have to be a all of the above approach to what we have to do. There's no one silver bullet and no one country can do this, by the way. <clears throat> we will need to re-engage as we did with the Obama administration. Uh, the president dispatched me to China. I negotiated with President Xi. We got the Chinese for the first time ever to change their approach to climate and join with us in announcing our intended reductions, which is what help create momentum going into Paris so other countries knew we were taking it seriously. So we have to bring China back on board. We have to bring India, Russia, reluctant countries, countries that didn't want to do anything last time. But I would remind everybody that in the 1970s, there was a Saudi oil minister who said that the, uh, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And the oil age is not going to end because we run out of oil. I think this is the moment where we will go into that transition that Vice President-elect Biden talked about in the last debate, where we excite uh, the incredible, innovative, creative capacity of a lot of countries on the planet. We will come up with the technology, but we have to most importantly raise our ambition globally as we go in to the Glasgow meeting, which is the follow-on meeting now to Paris, which will take place 
uh, next uh, year. And that's absolutely imperative. If we don't do that, uh, again, we're not going to get there. So this will be one of the most gigantic global organizational challenges, and, but we're up to it. And I think Mary has cited one of the single most important steps we could take is to have uh, not command and control telling companies how they have to do and what they have to do, but setting standards, which then people can follow and they can go out and innovate and, and figure out the best and cheapest and most uh, eff effective way of dealing with it. Uh, but pricing carbon and, and having a, a method uh, which has worked in other countries there are now four markets. There's one in the East Coast of America, Reggie. There's one in the West Coast, which involves Canada and the Western states, California. There is uh, China is going to be coming online with one. And then you have the European uh, uh, trading mechanism. That is going to contribute very significantly, I think, to accelerating the pace of meeting this challenge. So let me let me turn to, to President uh, Robinson. Uh, Secretary Kerry helped negotiate the, the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, President-elect Biden has said he's going to rejoin them. But uh, Secretary Kerry rightly reminds us we're really uh, now thinking about the road to Glasgow, the road to the, to the follow-on agreement. And I'd ask you, uh, President Robinson, uh, for some more specific ideas that should be on the agenda as we think not simply about getting back to the world of the, of the Paris Accords, but the follow-on accords that are essential to do what you and Secretary Kerry have talked about. Give us some specifics. Well, the first specific and a really important one is the Glasgow Conference, because that's where countries have to set out their nationally determined contributions. This is UN complicated language, but their commitment for 2030. Now, importantly, as Nick mentioned in the last session, China have committed to be uh, carbon neutral by at least 2060, meaning maybe before 2060. Um, Japan have just committed to be carbon neutral by 2050. I know that the Biden plan is to be carbon neutral by 2050. That's a bit too far away for the specific, you know, the specific measures we need to see now. So this COP is going to be extremely important, and it has to be led by the United Kingdom, which still hasn't set out as president what level it's going to uh, commit to. The European Union, the Commission of the European Union, has announced a at least 55% reduction of emissions by 2050. That's leadership. If you know if that becomes a reality in the planning of each country, which is what is uh, foreseen uh, but has to be done, uh, then we're, we're we're on track. And I loved the more bottom-up conversation, obviously, in the last session uh, with Raj and with Nick Stern, because I too have seen the impacts of this um, at, at, at local level. And countries are suffering desperately now from COVID. They need hope. They need to feel that countries are going to plan their way out of COVID aligned with the climate agreement. And that, as John was mentioning, is not necessarily happening. We're actually seeing a lot of countries powering up their economies once they start to reopen more with fossil fuel than with clean energy. We need to just make sure this is not happening and have a real leadership on this issue, which is why I have hopes for the Biden-Harris administration at the global level. So, Secretary Kerry, on this practical question of leadership to get us to a more sustainable future that protects the planet, there's talk that what the United States needs, what the president-elect Biden should think about is having some kind of climate czar, if you will, some sort of special presidential uh, appointee, emissary who, who is able to roam the world, talk to world leaders, uh, make the deals that are necessary to get to the world that you and uh, President Robinson have been talking about. And I'm going to be frank, there's been talk that that person might be you. So I want to ask you specifically, is that what, what something that you'd consider? Have you had talks with the President-elect Biden about the possibility of playing that kind of coordinating role? Uh, and, and how do you imagine yourself personally contributing to the future that you're describing? 
Well, I'm, you know, one way or, or the other, uh, David, I, I mean, this is something that I've been committed to for years and years. And, uh, uh, you know, I worked on acid rain. In fact, I was one of the people who designed the way in which working with John Sununu and Dick Celeste of Ohio, we put it together and, and we dealt with the problem of sulfur and acid rain. I think we can deal with this. Uh, and in one way or the other, obviously, uh, I want to be active and stay active in it. Uh, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to get in any discussions I've had or haven't had with with president. He's just starting his transition. And I think we've got to let him figure out how he wants to do all these things without piping in from the sidelines. So I, I, I don't want to pipe in from the sidelines. But I have said publicly many times, um, this is hard. This is going to be complicated. I mean, I remember the energy we have to expend to bring certain countries to the table last time. And I won't list them here publicly, but uh, many people know who they are, who were very reluctant to join and didn't want to do anything. So when President Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, frankly, lying to the American people about why he was doing it, because he, you know, he said that uh, it places too great a burden on the United States. Well, the fact is, uh, it didn't place a burden on any country, because one of the ways we managed to get it put together was adhering to a fundamental principle of the UN negotiations, which is common but differentiated responsibility. Everybody has a responsibility, but it's different as to what certain nations can do and, mu and must do. So every nation wrote its own plan. That's where we are today in the world. Every nation wrote its own plan. And nations currently are only doing what they think they can do. I don't think that's so, going to work. I don't think it's enough now. I think we so, have to call nations to do what we have to do to get the job done. And and by pushing that curve, we will do what, uh, what, what they did in World War II. I don't mean to drag this on, but in World War II, there's a book by Paul Kennedy, a professor at Yale University called Engineers of Victory. And in it, he writes about how, you know, key decisions had to be made in order to win the war. In 1943, they didn't know they would, but they made those decisions, how to gain air superiority. And boom, we were able to produce one B-24 every whatever number of minutes it was in Michigan. I mean, you know, we have to figure out how to take control of the sea. We have to figure out how to bust those defenses. Right. So without without refighting that, that war, just a secretary, here, I want to uh, just make make sure I understand. You don't want to talk about your own conversations with with President Locke Biden, but do you think this idea of having, in effect, a, a climate czar, somebody who is empowered to negotiate, uh, uh, travel the world, is that a good idea? Putting aside I, who ends up doing it, I personally believe it is essential. I do not think that you can achieve what we have to achieve uh, through the normal channels of the current bureaucracy. Uh, this has to be raised to a higher level because we're behind. We've just lost three and a half, almost four years, uh, and we're going to have to accelerate our efforts. And we have now a matter of months before we convene in Glasgow in order to raise the ambitions of the world in a way that has more intervals as 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 mary said a few months ago i mean 2050 2060 that doesn't excite me <laughs> honestly we need to hear what people are going to do by 2025 and 2030 and 2035 and that is what joe biden has already set out in his plan uh, the numbers of american buses that are going to be converted to electric the numbers of cars that are going to be you know the fleet changes the the incentives that would be put in place uh, the effort to change our, our electricity grid in America. I mean, all of these kinds of things have to happen. None of them easy. But uh, so the, let, the greatest, let me the ask a final David question. Of, no more denial. Of, uh, let me ask you, just about out of time. Um, I want to ask a final question of, of President Robinson. And that is just to ask you what the message you would send to the vice president-elect Kamala Harris, uh, her, her election is a historic moment for America. What does it mean to, to the world and to you as a prominent woman politician uh, watching this? Uh, her election, uh, I think, means a lot for women in the world. 
I don't think I need to offer any advice because I think her speech, her acceptance speech, was a wonderful recognition of what her role is, both within the United States and globally for women. And she seemed to me to fully understand um, the significance of the role that she is playing, will play. And uh, that's really important because uh, she's not going to do it like a man. She's going to do it um, with the advantage of being a woman, which is what I felt when I was elected president of Ireland 30 years ago on the same day as uh, Joe Biden. Uh, there was a, a bit of um, um, tweeting about that because we both have a connection with Ballina, my hometown, um, which is one of the places that uh, he, uh, his ancestors came from. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of partying going on in certain parts of Ireland at the moment <laughs> about the election. But actually, I think, you know, Kamala Harris um, has taken her position as a very uh, aware um, black woman with Asian roots, with Jamaican roots, um, just at the right time when women are very much more empowered now. We're seeing women-led countries do better in COVID. Um, we're seeing women take on much more responsibility in the IMF, in the European Investment Bank, and you know, uh, hopefully in the WTO with my friend Ngozi. If the United States just get behind her now, she was blocked by the, the um, uh, Trump administration. And women are taking their responsibility and her leadership will be really important. So my thanks to uh, President Robinson and Secretary Kerry for a rich, uh, uh, useful conversation for, for all of us. Thank you so much for joining us today and also to uh, to Rasha and, and Lord Stern earlier. So this afternoon at one, uh, please join us for Washington Post Live Election Daily, hosted by my colleague Bob Costa, featuring today Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer and a member of the Trump administration campaign advisory board, Ken Blackwell. Uh, as always, please head to Washington Post Live for the latest uh, on, on politics and the world ahead. Thanks for joining us.